Once upon a time, there was a girl who put a man on the moon. Her name was Margaret. When Margaret was a kid, her family would go on long drives across Michigan to visit her grandmother. They'd drive through lush forests, passing the occasional deer, and when she wasn't playing games with her siblings or singing to the radio with her mom, Margaret talked with her dad about all the questions she had rolling around in her head. As they bounced along the two-lane highway in their Lincoln Zephyr, the long beams of the car's headlights stretched out on the road in front of them. Margaret looked up at the night sky, and she wondered, why does the moon change shape every night? What would it take to build a bridge across Lake Michigan? How does gas make the car go? What happens when we die? And Margaret's dad wasn't like other grown-ups. He didn't shrug off her questions or pretend to know the answers. He welcomed her questions. He was a poet and philosopher at a small college, so he was as curious as Margaret. Question after question, she was conquering something, something bigger than the forest they were driving through, something bigger than Michigan, bigger than planet Earth itself. But she didn't know where her questions would lead her. I'm Purna Jagannathan, and this is Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, a fairy tale podcast about the extraordinary women that inspire us. This week, Margaret Hamilton. When Margaret started college in the 1950s, there were no computer science classes at all, because computers were still a brand new thing. So Margaret majored in math, and she studied philosophy and physics too. She didn't realize it at that time, but she was learning about all the things that made computers work. One day, she'd be a famous computer programmer. But first, she had a lot of studying to do. Now, Margaret was always one of the only girls in her math classes. But the head of the entire math department, she was a woman. Professor Florence Long had been teaching since 1914, way before most girls even went to college, let alone ran departments. For the first time, Margaret saw a woman doing work that she could imagine doing too. So she made a plan to go to graduate school and become a math professor. Margaret was a great student, but she was no wallflower. She liked being around people. They seemed to like her too. So much so that they voted her homecoming queen. And at college, she met James Cox Hamilton, the man who would become her husband. The two spent hours and hours talking about math and science. He studied chemistry. They both loved studying, and they planned to move to Boston for grad school after college. In Margaret's last year of college, the Soviet Union sent a satellite into Earth's orbit. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here an artist the satellite was called Sputnik 1. It awed the American people, but it also scared them. The Soviet Union and the United States were already enemies. And Sputnik started a space race between the two countries that made Americans anxious. People wondered, will the Russians get to the moon first? What if they conquer space? What if they send a rocket to the U.S.? So in 1958, President Eisenhower created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This was the beginning of NASA. The U.S. poured money into NASA's research. Anything they thought could get them ahead, on Earth or beyond. It was going to cost a lot to send astronauts to the moon, and there was no guarantee they'd make it there safely. But the clock was ticking, and the U.S. was all in. If they didn't hurry, the Russians would beat them to it. Margaret and James packed up everything they owned and set off for their new life in Boston. They were both headed to graduate school. But looking out the window at the fields and the houses as they drove across the country, Margaret found herself lost in thought. With both of them in grad school at the same time, money would be tight. So Margaret proposed a radical idea 
What if they took turns? First, she'd support them while he got his degree, and then it'd be her turn to go to graduate school while he worked. A woman supporting a man was practically unheard of at the time. But James didn't care, and Margaret was thrilled by the idea of working. Every day she'd scour the newspaper for jobs, and she found one at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. A professor in the meteorology department needed a research assistant who was a whiz at math, and he found one in Margaret. Professor Lorenz was designing computer programs that could predict weather patterns. It was Margaret's first introduction to writing computer code, and she was hooked. While coding, Margaret could take a question like, how far away is a thunderstorm? And she'd turn it into a mathematical language that the computer could understand. The computers back then were huge, by the way. Margaret wrote the code by punching tiny holes in a card that were fed into the computers. It was tedious and time-consuming, but when it worked, it was incredible. And Margaret was a natural. Soon, her new skills landed her another job at MIT, one that would take her a step closer to space. But first, she became a mom. On November 10th, 1959, Margaret gave birth to her one and only child. She named her Lauren. Margaret was only 23 years old, and she loved her job. She saw no reason why becoming a mother would change that. But not everyone felt that way. James was studying at Harvard Law School, and the students there were almost entirely men. Once a year, at an annual event, the wives of these Harvard Law men were expected to pour tea in a ceremony for their husbands and professors. No way, said Margaret. She didn't consider herself a Harvard Law wife. Besides, she had more pressing things to do than pour tea. Man had his first great success in space when the Russians pushed a man across the threshold. He was Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut the Russians lionized as the first to orbit the Earth. It was the... First a satellite and now a man in outer space? Russia was getting ahead. Like Margaret, President Kennedy was disappointed. But he was determined to. So he gave a speech that was broadcast across the country. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was the greatest pep rally of all time, and Margaret wanted to be part of it. So when she heard that NASA was teaming up with the lab at MIT, she wasted no time. Soon, Margaret had two interviews for different jobs working on the NASA project. And she was offered both. Margaret was psyched, but she didn't want to disappoint anyone. So she told them to flip a coin to decide who would hire her. Either way, she was going to work for NASA. Margaret's job was to write the navigation program that astronauts used to steer their spaceships. And everything had to work just right. Even the tiniest typo could lead to a catastrophe for the Apollo team using these programs in space. She had to make sure the astronauts got to the moon and back safely. Margaret and her team wrote so much code for NASA's computers that a printout of it could reach the top of Margaret's head. There's a famous photo of her from back then. She's standing next to a stack of the code they wrote. She's wearing a mini dress and big glasses. She has long, wavy hair, and she's smiling. She's 33 years old. Margaret was one of the only women working on the Apollo program, but she never felt like her coworkers treated her differently. They cared more about how fast she could write code than anything else. But there was one way she was different from the rest. Margaret was a mom. With the president, the country, and the whole world watching to see if the U.S. could get a man to the moon, Margaret had to work nights and weekends, so she brought Lauren to the lab with her. Sometimes the four-year-old would fall asleep on the floor of the office overlooking the Charles River. Other times, Lauren would use the lab like a playground. <laughs> 
See, the engineers had to test everything they built in the lab, so they knew it would work in space. They would run simulated flights over and over again, and they would sort of play at being astronauts. Whenever Margaret added new code to the program or had to rewrite some of it, she tested out to make sure the program still worked. Lauren would sit on the ground coloring as her mother typed out code on her computer. But then, when Margaret was ready to test the code, Lauren would stop to watch, transfixed as her mother flipped switches, turned dials, and sometimes laid on her back and worked computers overhead, just like an astronaut in a cramped spaceship. This all looked like a game of make-believe and Lauren wanted to play too. Margaret didn't mind, so she let her fiddle around with the flight simulator when she wasn't using it. But one day, Lauren flipped a switch that the programmers never meant to be used during the flight. She accidentally started a pre-launch program when the simulator was mid-flight. This confused the computer and it crashed in a big way. Margaret ran to see what had happened. To her, this was a happy accident. It was exactly why they ran simulators. She thanked Lauren for calling her attention to this, her little engineer helper. Margaret went straight to her bosses. She told them she wanted to add code to make sure that this would not happen in space. But the guys at NASA told her not to worry. After all, astronauts were trained to never make mistakes. But it turns out, they were wrong. On December 21st, 1968, NASA sent three astronauts on the Apollo 8 mission to orbit the moon. And on the fifth day of the mission, when the ship was headed back towards Earth, an astronaut did exactly what Lauren had done. He accidentally started a pre-launch program when the ship was still in space. This wiped out the computer's navigation data. And without it, the astronauts couldn't get home. After nine hours of searching frantically for solution, Margaret and the rest of the team back at MIT programmed a way to guide the astronauts back to Earth. She saved the day. But she was annoyed that NASA hadn't believed her. And Margaret wanted to make sure this never happened again. Seven months later, on July 16th, 1969, three astronauts boarded the Apollo 11 spaceship and launched into Earth's orbit. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 530 million people watched them take off. This was the mission Margaret and the rest of the team had been working towards. NASA had installed a camera on board so the astronauts could send pictures back to Earth for a live TV broadcast. Whether they succeeded or failed, the world was watching. Just minutes before Apollo 11 reached the moon's surface, the computer started spitting out frantic error messages. The mission was in danger. Luckily, Margaret had anticipated this kind of problem. And this time, her bosses had listened. She'd written code that told the computer to ignore the error messages and focus on the highest priority task. In this case, landing on the moon. So instead of aborting the mission, Apollo 11 landed safely. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All because of Margaret. Hello, I'm Cindy from California. I'm Aiden from New York. Today's episode was hosted by Porna Jagannathan, an actress and producer of the award-winning play Nirbaya. The podcast is produced by Timbuktu and based on the book series Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, written by our executive producers, Elena Favili and Francesca Cavallo. Did you know that Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls 2 just came out? Go to rebelgirls.co and use promo code REBELPODCAST to get your copy with a 15 
15% discount. Our producers are Alyssa Dudley and Darby Maloney. Sound design and original theme music are by Electra Bargiacci. If you like this episode, please share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it everywhere. And please review it on Apple Podcasts. Today's host, Porna Jagannathan, lent her voice to benefit the Joyful Heart Foundation. For Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls has made a donation in her name. Until next time, stay, stay tuned. tuned.